we have to start now. Um, uh, first, uh, let me know. I will let you know where, who I am. I'm Willy Semmler, member of the economics department and uh, fellow of the SIPA, the Schwarz Center of uh, Economic Policy uh, Analysis. And I want to welcome um, our speaker, Mark Jacobson. I want to welcome uh, our deans, well, several deans here. Welcome Mr. Um, Jackenberg, it's the deputy uh, consul of the German uh, consulate here in New York. Uh, out there. We now need some solar energy. Solar power is gone at night, yeah. So now I'm back. Um, and uh, this event was also uh, well nicely prepared by the SIPA staff, in particular with Bridget Fischer and Raphael um, Chappé. And uh, I'm grateful for their uh, help for the organization of this event. Um, this is, so to speak, the uh, inaugural lecture of, uh, on uh, economics of climate change uh, speaker series. Um, this is funded by the Thyssen Foundation and the German Consulate, and uh, the university was also of great help for this event. It's also funded by the um, uh, Institute for Macroeconomics in uh, Germany. It's an ongoing project that investigates how um, one can enact, so to speak, climate change policies, mitigation policies, adaptation policies, re renewable energy policies. Um, and particularly we're interested, so to speak, in the economic and social implications of those policies in this um, entire speaker series um, that is coming up in the next two years. Uh, we had two um, comprehensive uh, uh, po uh, conferences already before 19, uh, 2010 and 2011 on uh, the economics of climate change uh, were previously uh, sponsored by the Walker Foundation, Thyssen Foundation, and the EMK. And um, just some little advertising, we are having a huge handbook coming out on the economics, macroeconomics of climate change at Oxford University Press. It's also edited with Bernard Lucas and myself, and there will be a huge number of uh, research papers on this issue in it. Um, now, um, the, we have uh, uh, a lot of interest in this topic again. We had done it maybe a few weeks ago. Uh, would not have been such a big crowd there. Uh, the interest comes probably from two things. One is, uh, I guess, the re-election of uh, Obama, where probably climate change, renewable energy is hopefully or likely to be on the agenda again. If he put it there, or if he puts this there, I heard he's working on this. And the second event is, of course, the New York, uh, New York uh, hurricane and the disaster here, and many uh, Governor Como and uh, the press make a connection between the hurricane disaster here and uh, global warming. So uh, there will be definitely a lot of questions coming up in this area later. Uh, we have uh, now the speaker series for the next two years set up in a way that uh, we start with an inaugural speech by Mark Jacobson, but then later in the spring and uh, over the next two years, there will be high-profile speakers from the EU and the US, and uh, there will be on the list uh, uh, Bill Nordhaus and um, Ottmar Edenhofer. Everybody probably knows Bill Nordhaus um, working on uh, climate change models. Uh, Edenhofer was the lead uh, author in, on uh, renewable energy for the IPCC. Uh, then is coming Runge Metzger, he is the um, Commissioner for uh, Environment and Climate Change in uh, Brussels, so EU Commissioner. He will speak, actually you can mark it in your calendar already, on the 3rd of April he will be here. Then there are other people on the list, the usual suspects like uh, Stiglitz or Uzawa or uh, Japan and so on, so there were other important speakers uh, coming. Um, but uh, today we start with the inaugural lecture of Mark Jacobson. But before we get to this, I would like to have uh, uh, our Dean um, 
Michael Schober to make some remarks, and after this, uh, Dr. Schnakenberg. So Michael Schober is, uh, has been our dean for the last seven years, and uh, uh, it's great to thank him for support for this uh, climate change uh, projects and the several conferences that are going on. And uh, he wants to do some welcoming remarks. And actually, uh, they are from, he's from this, he graduated from Stanford University in uh, cognitive psychology, so uh, they are actually going to talk a lot after this uh, presentation. <laughs> okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, welcome. I'm Michael Schober, Dean at the New School for Social Research, and I am really honored to welcome you all here um, and to welcome Deputy Consul Schnackenberg and um, to thank Vili Semler for organizing and spearheading this project, which I think uh, really connects deeply with New School traditions and concerns. It's a serious topic that deserves serious attention, and having the kinds of conversations that Vili is organizing here uh, really can, are at the heart of what we like to do here at the New School. Um, Vili was correct to mention that issues of, of, of climate change and sustainability are are crucial at the New School and are actually represented not only in the economics department and very well there and throughout other departments at the New School for Social Research and Sociology and Politics and Anthropology and the rest, uh, but you may not be aware of just how deep the, the, the uh, deeply held the, um, the, the values that underlie this are at the New School. Um, we have um, an interdivisional undergraduate major in environmental studies, uh, bachelors of science and arts. Um, at the graduate level, not only in, uh, at NSSR, uh, but also at Parsons, we have masters in urban design, urban studies, design and urban ecologies, theories of urban practice, a transdisciplinary design program, and um, we've had um, huge success in the last year, if you didn't know it, in the Empower House project, uh, which is part of the Solar Decathlon competition, where we entered for the first time and were finalists. And a passive housing that was developed in, as our project there is now in production in Washington, D.C., and that was one of the selling points of our project was that it was the only one that is in production. So um, the issues here are important, and um, I'm really delighted to welcome you here for them. Um, and so without further ado, let me introduce, or Dr. Schnackenberg. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to introduce you. Dr. Schnackenberg is always the uh, Deputy Council General of the uh, German uh, Consulate in New York. Uh, he has uh, a law degree or a PhD in law from Frankfurt and uh, has been in the German Foreign uh, Service for a long time, since 1991. And he has uh, had positions in uh, different parts of the world, in India, in Ukraine, in Vietnam, and also in Iraq. So uh, lots of experience as a deputy, uh, deputy council. And uh, please uh, come forward. You may we would like to make some remarks. Thank you, Professor Semler. I've been to a lot of countries with a lot of solar power. And um, it's a great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to speak to you here tonight. And um, I'm very happy also that the continuation of the Economics of Climate Change Speaker Series has been made possible by a grant from the uh, Fritz Thyssen Foundation from Germany. Um, take my presence here uh, and my little contribution tonight as a token of solidarity and um, sympathy for all those who think that climate change doesn't get the, uh, at least so far, the political attention that it deserves in the US. In my country, voters make sure that no serious politician denies climate change. Even conservatives who otherwise trumpet free market melodies um, have realized that conservatism, conservatism means um, preserving and protecting the earth and the atmosphere. Strange country, isn't it? A country of ecological romanticists? Uh, well, investors from Wall Street don't think so. Uh, they invest heavily in Germany's uh, new offshore wind parks. They realize that Germany is a country that intends to maintain its leading role as the world's fourth largest economy, while it transitions to a low-carbon low and eventually carbon-free economy based on renewable energies. A country, mind you, that has less sunshine than New Jersey, but has a physicist at the helm. Um, one and a half years ago, after, after adopting a... Um, a non-nuclear green energy policy in the aftermath of Fukushima, Germany's energy landscape looks like a big laboratory. 
scientists, entrepreneurs, and citizens are excited to break the mold and move toward green technologies. A gigantic exercise of political, economic, and social fine-tuning has been set in motion to actually make the switch from nuclear to renewable energy. However, like a jigsaw puzzle, thousands of intricate and complex details still need to be put in place. Very briefly, our strategy has three key elements. First, a rapid expansion of renewable energy sources supported by additional high efficient gas power plants for the base load. Here, we are off to a good start. With about 25% of German power already derived from green sources, we are on track to hit our 2020 goal of 35%. Second, we need flexible and powerful grids. The federal government is about to adopt the construction or retrofitting of 5,000 miles of new high voltage power lines to get wind and solar energy where it is needed, and that is from north to south. This is an investment of about 20 billion euros over 10 years. And third, all this will be complemented by substantial increases in energy efficiency and the development of new storage technologies. At the same time, we will not back down on our climate protection goals. Greenhouse gas, em greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions are going to be reduced by 40% below 1919 levels until 2020. A last important point, it's to give you an impression it's not so easy. It's maybe not as easy as we expected it to be. The focus of the current debate is not on technology or feasibility, but on costs. The rapid expansion of green power comes with higher costs for consumers because the 20-year fixed feed-in tariff guaranteed to investors is financed by a fee added to each consumer's power bill. This incentive have, has proven, this is the, the upside, incentive has proven so powerful, so successful, that last year, for example, solar power producers added another 7,500 megawatt of installed capacity. 7,500 megawatt, that is the energy equivalent to six nuclear power stations. Last May, we produced 20,000 megawatt by using PV. Now, the downside is that this will increase the fee added to the monthly power bill of every consumer from an average 10 euros per month to 15 euros per month. Policymakers know that it is necessary to recalibrate the subsidies for the power producers. Only then can we stabilize electricity prices at current levels and maintain a fair distribution of the costs and risks of transforming our energy system. All this alone, however, will not be enough to slow the rise of the oceans. For this, we need America. I'm confident that more and more Americans will understand that green energy is a model to save the environment and to put people to work. 300,000, 380,000 green jobs and the burgeoning industries built around renewables and energy efficiency in Germany prove that these goals are not mutually exclusive. This debate invites the participation of the whole society, and it welcomes contributions from many walks of life. It shows energy policy concerns everyone, and it is in this sense that we very much welcome the work of renowned scientists like Professor Jacobson, who provide scientific justification for the economics of green energies, and that they will ensure that America is part of the green revolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we really need that uh, the Americans or U.S. joins uh, the project there in Germany. So uh, let me just introduce uh, Mark Jacobson. We are very happy to have him here tonight. Uh, if you look at the title of uh, his talk, it's um, very long and uh, it requires <laughs> quite an expertise in many areas. If you look at the title, and this is what Mark has. So Mark's Mark has uh, a long list of academic and uh, public policy uh, achievements, but it's based on his uh, original education. As um, He has a degree in um, 
many disciplines, in uh, civil engineering, in economics, environmental engineering, atmospheric sciences, and then he had a PhD in atmospheric sciences from the UCLA. He is a professor of uh, civil and uh, environmental engineering at Stanford University, the director of the atmosphere and energy program at Stanford, senior fellow at the Stanford Wood Institute of the Environment, and senior fellow, fellow of the Precour Institute for Energy. Uh, let me just name a few um, achievements in the academic and the public uh, policy field. Uh, he was one of the first ones who developed algorithms to uh, uh, undertake uh, atmospheric predictions and predictions of uh, carbon um, diffusion in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, so he is technically very, very trained. This is one of his uh, strengths. This is, this use has been used later in a lot of simulation models for the atmosphere, in particular 3D simulations. Um, he has done path-breaking work on the effects of emissions of uh, black and brown carbon, greenhouse gases, arising from different uh, energy sources. And he has studied the effects on the atmosphere, on agriculture, urban areas, living conditions, public health, and uh, overall to climate change. Um, he has now uh, come to the public, so to speak, I think um, that's where really uh, the press got aware of his talents when he published with um, Mark Delucci uh, important papers on renewable energy can do it, can do it in a very short time period. And the prediction in the early articles were, well, at least a new energy that can be installed could be all solar in 2030 and later 2050, uh, all energy could be solar, and, uh, sorry, um, renewable energy, and all energy could be renewable energy, mostly then wind energy. So I think this was this uh, publication that really brought him to the forefront of the public debate, and he became also advisor in the committee of the Secretary of uh, Energy and uh, was in congressional hearings and uh, is now involved also in, um, well, bringing renewable energy to New York. And uh, we will hear about this in this talk. He has published um, several books on atmospheric uh, um, pollution and atmospheric modeling, and uh, 130 papers published in scientific journals, uh, incredible amount of uh, um, papers and research and uh, activities. He has numerous awards. I don't want to go through all of them. Um, the uh, most important award is the, um, uh, he shares the Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Peace Prize from uh, 2007 by the, given to the IPCC uh, and uh, for particular for the important work on uh, uh, research and uh, on climate change and making the public uh, aware of this. So I would welcome uh, Mark Jacobson, and so please start, and you have a lot of time. So. Thank you very much, Willie, for inviting me to come and talk here. And if you notice my title, it's we're talking about how to uh, solve the energy problem and the climate problem, the air pollution problem in New York State as well as the world. Uh, but it's just an entire coincidence that uh, I'm here a couple weeks after the hurricane that passed. I didn't plan the hurricane to, say, to, to excite you about this talk. Um, so what I really want to do is talk about our plan, uh, well, try to motivate why do we want to solve this problem on a large scale and what, how can we actually technically solve the problem or of the problems that I'm going to talk about uh, through large-scale clean and renewable energy systems. Is it technically feasible? So first, let me identify from my point of view and probably hopefully from a lot of your points of view, why is this a serious problem? What are the problems that we're trying to solve? So I mean, air pollution kills 2.5 to 3 million people every year worldwide. And this is, to me, one of the significant 
problems in the world. Uh, in the United States, it's 50 to 100,000. In Europe, it's 300 to 350,000 a year. In China alone, it's about 800,000 people every year. If you live in a big city in the United States, your life is on average nine months shorter than somebody who lives in a rural area because of air pollution. And this is because of cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, complications from asthma. And it's a serious problem, and I'll try to quantify that economically as well. Um, even a larger looming problem in terms, well, right now air pollution, if you look at the cost, it's actually larger than global warming, but global warming is it's looming even larger and it's already causing huge amounts of damage and costs. Um, the Arctic sea ice will disappear within 10 to 20 years. Right now in September, it reached its lowest level in the satellite era, and I'll come back to that. Global temperatures are rising faster than any time uh, really in recorded history, even if you look at the deglaciation from the last ice age, the average temperature rise today is 10 times higher than the deglaciation from the last ice age. Now, this, so temperatures on Earth have been higher than they are today. 100 million years ago, there was no ice on the Earth and the temperatures were higher, but nobody lived back then. And if we actually flooded, if we actually melted all the ice on the Earth, most of which is in Antarctic, then sea levels would be 65 to 70 meters higher than they are today, and that would flood 7% of all the land on the Earth, mostly in coastal land where most people live. So this is a, a looming problem. But global warming also impacts other things, like the high, more higher temperatures increase air pollution, uh, cause heat stress, mortalities from heat stress, and increase diseases. Certain diseases, they only uh, occur in certain temperature ranges. And so you get higher uh, diseases at higher altitudes. Also, uh, agricultural crops are lost through uh, global warming. Yeah, people are displaced. Sea levels, well, the coastlines, as you can tell from New York State, uh, there are a lot of problems with the coastlines. Anyway, this is not a uh, talk about you know, why global warming is bad. I think we all realize it. Um, but I want to look at solutions mostly. Uh, but the other looming problem is that well, energy is limited, fossil energy is limited. These are limited resources by nature and populations are increasing, people's energy use is increasing. And so the cost of electricity is bound to go higher over time uh, because we're using a limited resource. In fact, we do notice that the electricity prices have been rising gradually uh, for a long time. And so how long can we sustain the rising prices before there's actually a there's not only shortages in the uh, fossil fuels, but we get uh, enough price stability that we get social instability and political instability. So these, there are drastic problems facing us today, and these drastic problems require drastic solutions. So before I get to the solutions, let's just look around us. I mean, if you look in the United States and Europe, most places in Europe, uh, you know, the air doesn't look that bad. It actually is still bad, but it doesn't, doesn't look as bad as it used to. Um, but we look around the rest of the world, the air pollution is actually getting worse in most places of the world. Emissions are actually higher now. Even though emission efficiencies of emissions, re, emissions per unit, let's say fuel from a vehicle or a power plant are going down in most developed, many developed countries, on average the actual total emissions are going up and of pollutants, of main primary pollutants that affect people's health. And this is expected to go up even further in the future. And we can see some examples of places today that look really bad still. Uh, Norels, Russia, here's Sikinda, India, you know, Linfen, China. It's like smoking three packs of cigarettes a day to live here. But in the United States, uh, Los Angeles was living in the Los Angeles in the 1970s was two packs of cigarettes a day. So we've gotten better, but we still haven't solved our problem. I mean, we still have significant problems. If we look, this is, this is New York City in 2009, which is pretty recent, um, a map showing the particulate levels. Uh, anything above seven micrograms per meter cubed increase, uh, that's where you get the highest increases of mortality. I mean, you can get you, any particulate level, you go down to almost zero and you have enhanced mortality from particulate matter. And there's no low threshold to the health effects of particulate matter, in other words. New York City, you know, 18 in lots of the city. 
So we calculate actually based on data, air quality data for ozone and particulate matter, and I'll show you some results of that. There are about 4,000 excess deaths every year in New York State from air pollution. And that costs a lot of money. It's $8 million a life according to the statistical cost of life, according to the U.S. government for morbidity and mortality. So that's $32 billion right there in the costs of air pollution mortality in New York State, and that's 3% of your GDP. So this is a significant problem that what you want to address simultaneously, and you can address this by changing the energy infrastructure. So th just to push this down a little further, this is what somebody living in Los Angeles, a teenager who died in a car crash, who was a non-smoker, that's what their lungs looked like in the 1970s. And that's equivalent to two packs of cigarettes a day. And living in any big city, you have some semblance of this even no matter how clean your city is, because there are no real clean cities. And so, again, I'm just trying to stress that these are problems that even though you look outside and, well, you don't see air pollution, it's there. I mean, these are now the particles are small. You don't see them, but they're there. And you're breathing. In fact, here's a, here's a girl who died a few weeks ago from asthma in California. Just to show these are real people. She was 17 years old, six, 17 years old. No, 22 years old, sorry. And so, you know, people die from air pollution, from excesses, but people who are really susceptible to it. So this is a significant problem. Global warming, as I said, is even a, it's a larger looming problem. And the temperature record from 1880, these are land-based measurements. You can kind of see the gradual rise, but as I said, the rate of change, especially in this part of it, is so high. It's the, fa it's the rate of change. It's not the absolute temperature. It's that rate that's going up so fast. If you want to you hear a climate skeptic saying, oh, well, we've had higher temperatures. Yeah, sure, but you've never seen this fast of a rise of temperature, especially in the presence of 7 billion people on the Earth. Uh, the warmest years on record, you know, 9 out of the 10 warmest years were in the 2000s. And so this is a significant problem. As I mentioned, the sea, well, okay, let me talk about the sea ice in a sec, but the surface temperature anomaly, remember the Hurricane Sandy, it's driven by warm sea surface temperatures. Uh, hurricanes, they form between 5 and 25 degrees north latitude, mostly, in the Atlantic. So that's way down in the, near the Gulf, down here. But, but, so you rarely see hurricanes come way up here. Because, one, first of all, they're, they're, coming from, they're coming from east to west. That's what the trade winds blow them from east to west, and they hit the Gulf. And then they, if they go north, they usually turn around and go back to the ocean. But what happened was the hurricane, it, it came a little bit north, as it, on its return, but it was blocked by a high pressure system. And then the sea surface temperatures, this is the anomaly. So the red indicates that you have a much higher than normal sea surface temperatures. And the higher than average sea surface temperatures are driven by global warming. It's about 0.8 degrees Celsius on average, higher than uh, worldwide and the worldwide average over the oceans. So this, that's where you get the fuel for a hurricane is warm sea surface temperatures. It's different from a cyclone. When you have the normal mid-latitude cyclones that come through, their power is driven by the north-south temperature gradient. For hurricanes, their power is driven by the warm sea surface temperatures. And so you, this anomaly, it's, you know, you're bound to get stronger weather if you have a hurricane passing through. With regard to sea ice, this shows the black is kind of the normal sea ice ex, uh, in square, millions of square kilometers, the extent in millions of square kilometers. That's the normal. And this dash line was in 2007. It went down pretty low, and it fluctuates each year. But this last year, in September, you reached the lowest level ever recorded in satellite history. So less than, you know, close to 3 million square kilometers compared to a normal of on the order of 6.5 million square kilometers in September during the summer. So this is going down really fast. And we expect if you eliminate that sea ice, then... The sea ice is relative refle relatively reflective, so it bounces sunlight off and keeps the ocean cool there. But if you have no more sea ice, you have the dark ocean below, which absorbs sunlight and heats up more rapidly. So you have a positive feedback that triggers more rapid climate change. So things will only get worse if that disappears. Because once, if, you can get, if you get rid of it in the summer, it makes it much harder for it to actually grow back in the other seasons. Uh, because you need... It needs to really form next to a body that's existing. So if you have less of a body, less fewer bodies existing, the whole your whole Arctic is an ocean. It's not a land at all. Okay. So how, what's the solution? So we've been working on 
the problems for a long time and also for the on the solutions. So we did a study in 2009 trying to evaluate different proposed energy solutions to these problems. And we looked at them first ignoring costs entirely, just what are the best ones in terms of actually solving the problems. And in terms of many environmental effects and reliability and externalities, including what's the global warming potential, what's the air pollution potential, what's the land use required, the water required, uh, reliability, catastrophic risk associated with different technologies. And we came up with uh, a ranking, so I'm not going to go into the details of the ranking, although I will explain in more detail in the next few slides why the ones that are not recommended are not recommended. But the, first, start with the ones that are recommended. First, and these are divided here into electric power and vehicle options. And not everything is on this list, uh, but I'll t fill in the blanks when necessary. Uh, but the ones that were recommended because they had the best overall environmental impact in terms of solving the problems, again, we're not looking at costs yet, were wind, concentrated solar power, which I'll explain a little bit later, uh, th geothermal power, tidal, photovoltaics, wave-powered hydroelectricity. And, you know, they all have some issues associated with them. I'm just not saying they're perfect. But they were better than these other ones, which themselves were some of them were better than what we currently have. So the ones that are not recommended are not necessarily not better than what we have in some cases. Sometimes they are worse, actually, but in some cases they are better than what we have. It's just they're not so good as these other ones, and I'll explain why. So they represent really opportunity costs. If you have a certain number, amount of money to spend on something that's not as efficient, why would you spend that when you can get something more efficient and solve the problem? So uh, in terms of uh, vehicles, uh, the ones that were recommended were the what we call wind, water, and sun, which are all these seven here, uh, powering battery electric vehicles, and also to some extent hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. So what's not recommended were nuclear power, uh, coal with carbon capture and sequestration, which is, quote, clean coal, uh, natural gas or biomass for electricity options, and then for vehicles, corn or cellulosic or sugarcane ethanol, or soy, or algae, biodiesel, or compressed natural gas. So let me explain in a little more detail why we wouldn't recommend some of these. So why not natural gas? So because we're comparing with the good things, which are like wind and solar, geothermal, and we're not comparing with what we currently have. We're trying to say, what's the best we can do? And compared to wind, for example, Natural gas puts out 50 to 70 times more carbon dioxide equivalent emissions and air pollution uh, because it's a combustion process. Natural gas, you have to burn, and burning creates pollution. There's mining of the fuel during the lifetime as well. It's mining and transport of the fuel. So it it's, has to do with not only the burning to create the energy, but also the obtaining of the fuel. So it's a lot. And then... Well, methane from natural gas, as well as black carbon from natural gas flaring, these are the two main uh, pollutants that, that affect, well, carbon dioxide overall affects the Arctic sea ice the most, but methane and black carbon have short lifetimes. So if you reduce their emissions, you can control the loss of the Arctic ice the best. Black carbon is a particulate matter that comes out of diesel exhaust, but also from jet fuel burning and from kerosene burning and, uh, meth and natural gas flaring and also uh, from biofuel burning and biomass burning. But it has a lifetime of a week to a few weeks in the atmosphere. So, and it ha but it's a million times stronger per unit mass than carbon dioxide at causing warming. So if you can control the, the emissions of black carbon, you can control the temperature effect. And it causes about, uh, it causes about 15 to 20% of all global warming. Uh, CO2 causes about 40 to 42% of global warming. Methane is the third most important greenhouse gas. It causes on the order of 14 to 15% of global warming. And methane has a lifetime of about 10 years. So it's much longer than, than black carbon, but much shorter than CO2. So if we control methane, it actually has a faster impact than controlling uh, CO2. And it also has a, about a, now according to the new IPCC of 2012, it has about a 30 
two times higher global warming potential than CO2 on the 100-year time frame, but we're really interested in the 20-year time frame, which is the time frame of which the sea ice will maybe disappear. And there it has about an 85 times to 105 times a higher global warming potential than carbon dioxide. So methane is a significant concern for the Arctic sea ice, as is black carbon. But natural gas, that's one of the main components that it emits. So why would we want to put out something that causes you know, huge losses of the Arctic ice? Now, people say that natural gas is a bridge fuel uh, because it's cleaner than coal. Natural gas is cleaner in terms of air pollution, but it actually causes more global warming than coal. And when I say cleaner in terms of air pollution, only with respect to certain pollutants. Specifically, natural gas in the United States, the mining and the transport and use of natural gas, it produces more carbon monoxide, more ammonia, more volatile organic carbon, and more methane than coal. Coal produces more CO2, more SO2, sulfur oxides, more particulate matter. And, but the particulate matter in the sox, uh, oxides of sulfur cause more health damage. So coal causes more health damage than natural gas. However, the same particles and the same SO2 that natural gas puts out, so that coal puts out, actually, ironically, uh, reflect a lot of radiation. So reduce the warming impact of, of coal versus natural gas. But they're both bad. One causes more health problems. One causes more warming problems. People have been saying, well, they just focus on the methane and the CO2. And they say, well, if you just look at the CO2 and the methane, maybe uh, coal causes more warming than natural gas. And that's arguable depending on if it's from fracking, which increases the methane from, uh, because you have more leakage. But it actually doesn't matter. It's pretty, it might be close one way or the other, especially if you look at the 20-year time frame, they're really probably close. But it actually doesn't matter because this, the offsetting of the warming by oxides of sulfur from coal are so much greater than, than all the rest of it in terms of the margin that coal always causes less warming than gas. Now, it's not to say coal is good. I'm not trying to say that at all. Don't go and say, oh, Jacobson says that coal is good. <laughs> I'm trying to say they're both bad. They're not a bridge, one is not a bridge fuel. They, we need to get rid of both and replace them with clean energy. Okay, and well, hydrofracking, as you probably all know, has other issues and uh, land and water supply and road degradation, and I'm not gonna get into that because it's, I think, pretty well known here. Okay, so, but why not clean coal? So I've been talking about dirty coal, but what about clean coal? Clean coal, really all they're doing is taking CO2 from the coal, from the stack, and pumping it underground. But it actually takes about 25% more energy to do that. And so you need 25% more coal, 25% more coal mining. All the other pollutants actually go up 25%. Oxides of sulfur, oxides of nitrogen, carbon monoxide, particulate matter. So you're actually making it dirtier coal. So it really should be called dirtier coal than normal. <laughs> So I don't understand why it's called clean coal, because nothing is cleaner, even because the CO2 is not a typical air pollutant. It just has to do with greenhouse gas emissions. But you're, reduce, you're increasing everything else, which includes some greenhouse gas emissions, including some black carbon and methane. OK, so anyway, this is even a non-starter. But it produces 150 times more air pollution than wind per unit energy generated, 50 times more kilo, uh, CO2 still than wind. Why not nuclear? Well, it's cleaner than all the other two, but it's still 9 to 25 times more pollution per kilowatt hour than wind energy uh, from two things, mainly mining and refining of uranium and the building of the plant is one, but also what's called the opportunity cost. It takes so long to put up a nuclear plant through both the planning and construction phase. It's 6 to 10 years for the permitting and 4 to 9 years for the construction. So it's 11 to 19 years. So actually, it should be 10 to 19 years. My math is not too good. Uh, 10 to 19 years, and that compares to two to five years for your typical wind farm or solar farm. And so during that time while you're waiting around for the nuclear to come up, you have a huge amount of emissions and from the background electric power grid, which is now 50% coal in the U.S. on average. It varies by state. Though. So there's half of it, half of this 9 to 25 times is this opportunity cost. The other half is due to the mining and refining all the energy that it takes to put it into uh, the nuclear. Now this is changing and it depends on what your electric power system looks like. So this could get cleaner over time, but then there are other risks that we have to consider. One and a half percent of all nuclear reactors ever built on Earth have melted down to some degree. 
including most recently in Fukushima. Now, one would argue, well, that's maybe it's not a huge health risk, but it's, it is a lot in terms of the damage in Fukushima right now. For example, uh, they're, they're doing studies on the thyroids of all the children who live around there. So they studied 87,000 children, and about 43% of them have enlarged thyroid cysts. And so this is something, now these aren't cancers yet. You have to wait several years to see if they're cancers, but uh, these are cysts that they do not, normal rate is on the order of 2%. So, it's, so that's an, uh, a risk. Chernobyl, of course, was a more larger scale problem. You know, other ones haven't been so significant, but there are risks. There's, whereas there's zero risk of this happening with these clean energy sources. Weapons proliferation is even a larger looming issue. It would take, to repower the entire world's energy infrastructure for all purposes, you would need about 16,850 megawatt nuclear plants if you want to do all nuclear. Even if you just just 5% of that, that's about 800 nuclear plants. Right now, the world has on the order of 400 nuclear plants, so you double the number you have today. So more countries of the world would have nuclear energy facilities. Well, it turns out there are at least five countries of the world who've developed nuclear weapons capabilities secretly under the guise of nuclear energy facilities, or have tried to. And while, again, it hasn't necessarily caused a catastrophe yet, uh, there's a risk that it may. And so this is a concern. Why do we need to have this risk of nuclear weapons proliferation uh, that is associated with nuclear energy facilities when we, d we don't need it? And then there are waste issues. Okay, finally, why not ethanol? So just an example for a biofuel. Well, we've looked at this intensely in terms of the air pollution. It's still a combustion. Once you produce ethanol, you burn it in your car like you would gasoline. And uh, it's, it causes, on, we did for the United States, you would increase the air pollution mortality rates about 4% compared to gasoline because you have, you trade off pollutants. While you have less uh, higher uh, aromatic compounds like benzene and, and uh, toluene, you have less benzene and toluene, you have more acetaldehyde and formaldehyde, which are, have, are smaller chain organics. So you have, you trade off some carcinogens like benzene, for example, and you have less butadiene, which is a carcinogen, but acetaldehyde and formaldehyde are both carcinogens. But the acetaldehyde and formaldehyde, they're actually very potent ozone formers. So you get more ozone, which is a major cause of air pollution mortality. In fact, in Los Angeles, we found a 9% increase of the mortality if you converted everything to ethanol. And this actually goes up significantly when you go to low temperatures. And, and these numbers, the 4% was at a normal room temperature. But when you go down to like, uh, cold temperatures where it's snow on the ground, this goes up like, like an order of magnitude. It's really significant. That, and there are very few people talk about what happens at cold temperatures. Uh, but ethanol is just very inefficient at those low temperatures. So that's just the air pollution. You're not going to improve anything compared to gasoline. Uh, what about for uh, CO2? Well, if you use corn ethanol, depending on if you're accounting for land use change uh, and the fact that when you use f uh, corn for fuel instead of food, that changes the price of corn and that changes land use around the world. Uh, so that, if you account for land use change, one study found up to a doubling of the CO2 emissions compared with gasoline. Uh, whereas the best study showed only a 10% benefit compared to gasoline if you use corn ethanol. Cellulosic ethanol, the range is better, 50 to 150%, depending on if you count for land use change or not. Cellulosic is like prairie grass if you want to do this on a large scale. But I'll show you that land area is required. It's just, you know, you just need too much land to do this on a large scale. Where, but also, I mean, this is compared to 1% of CO2 emissions versus, uh, compared with gasoline if you use wind powering battery electric vehicles. So you can eliminate 99% of all your CO2 by driving a battery electric vehicle powered by wind or solar. So why would you want to use cellulosic ethanol? In fact, there's not even a single cellulosic ethanol factory in the world that's commercial. It's been promised since 1981. All this money's been put into it, and yet they still don't even have a factory that produces cellulosic ethanol. So it doesn't even exist. And yet, this is something that's being touted and being pushed, and you know, taxpayers are still funding. I mean, there's still funding going to not only research, but also uh, actual try to developers to put up these factories, and they just don't exist because it's too difficult to do on a commercial scale. And yet, this is what we're competing with when we already have solutions that are on the road. I mean, you know, wind, you know, solar powering battery electrics, wind powering battery electrics, these exist. These technologies exist. In fact, I drive an electric car powered by solar on my roof. I have for the last, last three and a half years. 
And it's, so it's just wondering why are people even talking about it. And this thing, the fuel cost of an electric car is one-fifth that of a gasoline car. It costs 80 cents a gallon equivalent to drive. I mean, the car is more expensive, higher capital cost, but lower fuel cost. So if you drive 15,000 miles a year, then you'll save, if your average is 15,000 miles a year, $4 a gallon of gasoline, 80 cents a gallon for electric car. That's, you'll save over the lifetime of a car over 15 years, that's $20,000 you'll save. If the price of gasoline doubles to $8 a gallon, you save $40,000. So if your car costs $20,000 more than your electric car costs $20,000 more than your gasoline car, uh, then you're going to, uh, you'll break even. If it costs less than $20,000 more, you're going to make money over time. So since they, a lot of the electric cars now, especially with a federal tax credit of $7,000, they're about the same for the commodity sized cars, it seems it makes no sense anymore why anybody would buy a gasoline car or a diesel car for that matter. Because the range now, uh, Tesla Model S now, which just came out as now the car, the motor trend car of the year, goes 310 miles on a charge and you can charge it in one hour and with a, with a 440 volt charger. So, and it, it accelerates, I mean, it's not even the, the Tesla Roadster, which is the fastest accelerating car in the world, but it still accelerates at the high speeds of 60 to 70 miles. It actually accelerates faster than the Roadster. Uh, they have a huge amount of torque. They, they don't use any fuel. They can be run on you know, wind or solar. They can be charged really quickly. They can go 300, as I said, 310 miles now. It just makes no sense why anybody would buy ever again another gasoline or, or diesel car because you eliminate all the air pollution from it. So let's look at these technologies. Wind. Wave and wave power. So that, just a few pictures. Well, you all know what a wind turbine does. It extracts energy, uh, the w from kinetic energy from the wind, uh, converts that into electrical energy, which is transmitted to uh, end use. Uh, wave power, you take the up and down motion of wave, mechanical energy, convert it to electrical energy, and then there's a cable underneath the water that goes back to shore uh, to generate electricity. Um, hydroelectric power. Uh, you have a dam. Well, there's two ty there's two main types. There's the ones with dam, and then there's run of the river where you don't have a dam, where you just take the moving stream water and then extract the electricity with a, a turbine. Uh, here you have falling water that runs through a turbine that turns around and uh, runs through a generator and create electricity. Uh, tidal power is just a wind turbine under the water, and so it just runs on the same concept. Uh, but the tides are very regular, so they're less intermittent than the winds in the atmosphere. Uh, geothermal power, you take basically energy from under the ground, if that's well, hot rocks under the ground, and extract that energy. Sometimes it's by drilling two holes, one where you push water down, you heat up the water by hitting the rocks, and it comes up the other hole, and then it goes through a power plant to generate electricity uh, from, the, from the steam, you run it through a steam turbine. Uh, but there are also other types of geothermal. You can have geothermal heat pumps in your backyard, where you, uh, it's basically for heating or cooling, air, heating or air conditioning, uh, where you basically tap, you, you just run pipes under the ground and where it's warmer in the winter than in the air and you extract the heat and it runs your um, heating and, and also air conditioning as well. Um, and I'll also show you a really cool um, uh, seasonal heating structure that's geothermal in nature in a second. Uh, concentrated solar power, it's when you focus light off of mirrors to a central tower receiver and heat a fluid, such as a molten nitrate salt, that can then be used immediately, well, that can heat water to generate steam and run through a steam turbine, uh, which can be, the, the molten nitrate salt can be stored overnight and be used at night, so you can store electricity at night. In fact, uh, this plant in, uh, in Spain uh, has actually, well, well, there's one plant, I'm not sure if it was this one, um, was, yeah, this, this plant actually stored electricity and, and ran 24 hours straight last summer. Uh, and so it's, it's a way to store energy for when you want to use it. Uh, solar PV can be even in power, either in power plants and large, large power plants or on rooftops, as you all know. And there are different ways to finance solar. Uh, one is community-based, another is where let's say you have a community that wants to each, you want to get a lower price for your solar, the whole community can go in together and buy solar panels in a, in a sunny place. And you know, they get, so they get a lower price for the panels and then they uh, generate their own electricity, but not necessarily on their roof. 
Um, anyway, there are a lot of policy mechanisms to enhance the use of solar in New York State and elsewhere. What about cars? Okay, well, here's the Tesla model, sorry, the Tesla Roadster, which I said is the fastest accelerating car in the world. It goes 243 miles on a charge, and it's a 220 volt charger, so this takes three and a half hours to charge. This one does. But this, this is the Model S on the right. That takes, you can do it in one hour now, and it goes 310 miles, and it seats up to seven people. It's five people comfortably and two jump seats in the back, and it has trunk in the, both the front and the back. And, and this is the Nissan Leaf, but this only goes 80 miles, so it's not so good. But there are a lot of um, uh, other cars that uh, have intermediate ranges now. Uh, this, this is an example of a hydrogen fuel cell bus, electric truck, and a hybrid hydrogen fuel cell electric uh, bus. Uh, yeah, so these are all existing technologies. In fact, all the technologies we're looking at are existing pretty close, like, all, except with one, example, one exception in a second. Uh, this is a hydrogen fuel cell ship that exists. This is a hydrogen fuel cell tractor. And the, hy the hydrogen in this case is uh, produced by electrolysis, where you're just running electricity through water. It's one of the oldest ways of producing hydrogen. Uh, this is an electric ferry that can go back and forth, runs purely on electricity, only on batteries. Uh, so this is a cryogenic hydrogen aircraft. This one's a drawing only, although uh, the Russians built a aircraft in the 1980s called the Tupolev that was built on hydrogen. The space shuttle was a hydrogen aircraft. So these, this is an existing uh, technology. Notice that the, uh, this aircraft is larger. You need more volume because hydrogen is not very dense. And, but it weighs less because hydrogen, because it doesn't weigh very much, uh, you have less mass but greater volume. So you get the, about the same amount of drag. So it's about the same overall efficiency. But that's probably the last thing that will change. Uh, because the airline industry is pretty slow to change. Not because they can't do it. <laughs> they could do it faster. Okay, what about heating and cooling? Well, there's air and water source and ground source heat pumps. Uh, these are just extracting energy out of the air or out of the ground or out of water and using that to generate heat. And you could put that in a water heater so you could heat your water with these heat pumps. Uh, and they can re this can be run in reverse for air conditioning, but it's much more efficient than an electric resistance heater, which is another option, which is just your standard heating up a coil and heating your room. Um, and this is a solar hot water preheater that can reduce the use of energy for your hot water heater here. Um, this is a neat uh, plan, or that's not a plan, it's actually a community in Canada that's existed at a further north latitude than here. It's called Drake Landing Solar Community in Alberta. And what they do is uh, they, in the summer, they have uh, solar, solar, not PV panels, but the solar thermal panels on their garage. And they ex extract heat during the summer. Uh, the heat heats a glycol solution that's piped to and heats water in storage tanks. So you have water here in storage tanks. The water is then uh, pumped underground through pipes and stored until winter. It's thermally insulated around it and you, then in winter time, this uh, produces about 80 to 90% of all their heat for the winter. So it's a seasonal storage method. It's, it's pretty simple, doesn't require outside energy, and it works. They've been doing it for five years. You should check out this website. So, I mean, these are things that you can do that you don't need to burn gas, you don't need to burn wood pellets, you don't need to burn anything if you're actually just imaginative and put your mind to it. So, okay, what about the world, U.S. and New York? Can we power the entire world with renewable energy? So the world power demand, end-use power, that's what actually people actually use, is 12 and a half terawatts. Well, this was 2010, so it's a little higher now. In 2030, the, transit, the uh, trajectory was about 17 terawatts if we use conventional fuels. If we convert everything to electricity and hydrogen, because of the efficiency of electricity compared to combustion, and what I mean by that is, of uh, the plug to wheel efficiency of an electric vehicle is about 80 to 86%. In other words, 80 to 86% of the electricity going into an electric car goes to move the car. Uh, the rest is waste heat. For a gasoline or diesel car, it's on the average in the US about 17 to 20%, although there's some cars that are more efficient. So there's a factor of four to five difference in the efficiency. And as a result, you need less energy to move your car and your price of electricity, your, of moving the car is less. For So if you actually account for that, so transportation, you get a huge benefit by, of conversion. 
Now, you also get some benefits of conversion in other sectors as well, but not, create, not so much. A hydrogen fuel cell car, its overall efficiency, when you count for all the efficiency losses, on the order of 25 to 30 percent. So it's a little more efficient than internal combustion, but still one-third the efficiency of electricity. So we'd, we'd want to use electricity as much as possible in hydrogen uh, second. When you account for these transformations, there's about a 32% change reduction in your power demand. So this is without changing your lifestyle, uh, just by converting to wind, water, and sun, and electricity and hydrogen. And if we do that in the US, there's a greater reduction because we're more reliant on transportation as part of our energy mix. And so you get 37% reduction. And New York State actually mirrors the US pretty well in this respect. So there's a 37% benefit. And this is before uh, actually you know, efficiency measures major. Well, there's some efficiency measures built in here, some small ones. But it turns out, you know, if you, through efficiency, you can actually reduce power demand by on the order of 20 to 30 percent in the U.S. And this only assumes a 5 to 10 percent reduction because it assumes people are going to be wasteful, just to be conservative. Because it's, if you can show that you can do this when people are not conserving, then it makes it even easier to do. Uh, if they are conserving. And, but so there is room to actually reduce this more just through efficiency measures that we would encourage too. But we're trying to see, can we plan it, can we power the world without people changing their lifestyles or even changing their light bulbs very much? Uh, I'm not encouraging that, by the way. <laughs> so, so I think everybody should change to LED light bulbs. I would really, uh, you go down by a factor of 20 in your energy use compared to the incandescence. Okay, so this is the number of devices for power in the entire world. If we wanted to provide 11 and a half terawatts, so that's the number the, back here. 11 and a half terawatts is the end goal for 2030, the end use power demand. So we want to see how many devices do you need to power this much uh, energy. And this is for all purposes, by the way. This is for heating, cooling, transportation, and industry, and electric power, not just the electric power portion. Because the electric power portion is only a small part, part of that. It's on the order of like two terawatts or something. So, uh, so this is one scenario. And again, this is not the only scenario that's possible. There are thousands of scenarios that are probably possible. But this was based on a couple of factors. Well, it's mostly wind and solar because those are the only two energy sources that could theoretically power the whole world on their own independently because there's enough resource. Uh, and wind is less expensive than solar, even though the price of solar has come down quite a bit. So wind is a little more than solar. But we want to keep them in balance because to try to deal with the intermittency issue, you need similar amounts of wind and solar if you don't have something else uh, to address the intermittency. So I'll talk about that later. But so we have 50% wind. That's 3.8 million 5 megawatt wind turbines to power half the world for all purposes. Now that sounds like a lot, right? 3.8 million. But you know the world produces 70 million cars every year, and this is a one-time, this is a one-time installation over 30 years. Let's say if that's how long your wind turbine lasts, it could last longer. And you know the United States produced in World War II produced 330,000 airplanes in five years, and the world produced 800,000 in five years. So how hard is it to produce 3.8 million wind turbines to power half the world for all purposes? Uh, then we have. Roof, PV rooftop systems on rooftops, and then there's power plants, PV power plants, and CSP power plants. That's another 40% uh, split between the CSP and the PV. The 6% PV rooftop systems, that represents 1.7 billion 3 kilowatt systems. Now that, some, well, a lot of houses would have much larger systems, anywhere from 5 to 15 or 20 kilowatts. Businesses, commercial buildings might have 50 to 150 or 200 or 500 kilowatts in some cases. So, so we can, you know, th this doesn't represent how many uh, buildings necessarily. It just represents how many if there are three kilowatts in size. And if we can get more rooftops, that would even be better because then you're taking up less land in particular. Now, a geothermal is 4%, of which 1.7% is in place. Uh, and, uh, and then a hydro is 4%, but 70% of that is in place. So we're not looking to increase hydro very much because there are issues associated with hydro uh, including land use issues and, uh, and fish issues, and people just gen generally don't like to see too many dams around. And so we don't envision increasing that. And if we can get, if we can avoid hydro, that'd be great. But it's a really good load balancer because you can turn it on and off instantaneously, and it has virtually no CO2 or air pollution emissions associated with it, although there are some. 
And so that's why they're pretty good. But it does have some water issues and land use issues associated with it. Now, tidal and wave, we don't expect to grow very much. But so they're kind of just token in here uh, because I think they would they would be helpful. And they are coming along. Tidal is coming along a little faster than wave. But they're existing technologies uh, that are more expensive than the others. What about New York State? Uh, for New York State, we did a similar analysis. And we need, let me go back really quickly to this one. We need about 0 0.06 terawatts to power the entire state in 2030. That's uh, the end use power demand. So in this case, again, this is one scenario, but it's not by any means the only possible scenario. Uh, it would be 50% wind. You have less solar than you would in other places. So the solar is a little bit, uh, well, it's, we've divided the solar up into more things here, but we have a 6% here, 12% 12, uh, 12 here, so that's 18, plus another 10%, uh, that's 28, this is 38. So we have about 38% solar instead of 40, so it's a little bit less overall. But it's divided into the residential, which are five kilowatt systems here, uh, commercial government rooftops, 100 kilowatt systems, solar PV uh, power plants, 50 megawatt power plants, and then some CSP. But again, you know, if you have more CSP, uh, PV versus CSP, or if you have more PV versus CSP, that's fine. And this is just one scenario. But we would need, we would power this 40% offshore wind. So it's about 13,000 offshore wind turbines and about 4,000 onshore turbines to get 10% of the energy. Uh, but this is, re again, replacing all natural gas in the state, all nuclear, uh, all coal. I mean, there's 10% of the energy in, in the state is coal right now, 30% is natural gas, there's about 35% nu nuclear. And then there's hydro, and which is, we're keeping the hydro, because, but the hydro, 89% is in place, so we're barely increasing the hydro in this. That would account for 5.5% of all the energy in the entire state for all purposes. And we just have 1.5% wave and tidal power. But again, this is not fixed. It could, this could be variable, but this would be technically feasible. What about resource analysis? So we we do a lot of mapping of winds and solar, and this is a map of the wind speeds worldwide. And you can see that the the red is strong winds, and anywhere where the wind speed is seven meters a second or faster is really cost competitive. Offshore, you probably want seven and a half meters a second or faster because it's more expensive. So. But you can see offshore, I'll, I'll focus in on New York in a second, but you can see where the great wind resources of the world are. Offshore, the East Coast is one of the biggest wind resources of the world. It's very shallow. It used to be land during the last ice age. Now, the West Coast is also very good, except that it's deeper. The ocean goes down deeper. Now, there are floating turbines that are being developed, so it may not then matter if it's deep or not. But right now, this is a really good resource that there are no, absolutely no turbines on right now. But uh, Sahara... Desert in Africa has huge resources. Uh, the Australia has really good resources. Northern Europe, uh, in the Yellow Sea and near Japan, they're offshore. They're really good resources. Uh, the Great Plains is called the Saudi Arabia of wind. It's got the bit one of the biggest resources of the world on land. Uh, there are a lot of places, and worldwide, there are about 70 to 80 terawatts over land of wind at seven meters a second or faster outside of Antarctica. So that's six to seven times more world end use than, than we need for the end use power demand in 2030. So that's why I say there's plenty of wind to power the whole world on its own. But we only need to exploit uh, about 5.75 terawatts out of 70 to 80 terawatts. So we're not really even taking up very much of the wind. And this is just over land and high wind locations. Let's look at New York in a little more detail. This is from higher resolution calculations and modeling. So you can see the red. Well, this is in terms of capacity factor. And really, anything with a capacity factor of 30 and higher is OK, but 35 is better. And probably where you start putting your wind, you know, 40% is great. 45% uh, is, is really incredible uh, for offshore. That You can see the offshore potential of the East Coast right near New York is just phenomenal. It's just amazing that nobody's ever put any turbines up here yet. It's, uh, I mean, it's just totally wasted energy that's going. The, and then, but there are places on land. I know there's a lot of resistance to people. Not there's a lot of nimbyism and not in my backyard. But you have to think about what are you replacing. Nobody wants to add anything to the environment. 
but you're replacing something. If you don't have wind, you're going to have natural gas, you're going to have nuclear, you're going to have coal. What would you rather have? Something that's killing your children or something that's uh, going to save, save your, solve your problems, reduce the climate impacts, uh, reduce your the asthma, cardiovascular disease, respiratory illness, and, and, and supply stable energy supplies at constant cost over time. Uh, here's another map from data alone that we've done. We mapped the world's winds from data alone to, in fact, it's still the only map of the world's winds from data. And you can see off the east coast, these are from uh, towers near, near shore. Very strong winds. Anything that's black, red, yellow, uh, green, or dark blue are all really good wind resources. Just the light blue, just the, or moderate light blue, and the really light blue are not good. And, but anyway, the, you can see the winds are pretty good in New York State. Uh, for solar, there's even more solar available than wind. There's 30 times more solar in high solar locations than you need to power the entire world for all purposes uh, in 2030. And so the solar resources aren't so great in New York State as they are in the southwest of the U.S., uh, but they're actually not bad. I think I have another map. Yeah, here. Here's an NREL map of solar uh, in the United States. And so in New York State, you have between four and four and a half kilowatt hours per meter squared. You know, so it's, it's lower than what you have in, say, California or definitely in the southwest. But it's actually not so bad. I mean, it's, so we, you take a, maybe a 20 or 30 percent hit in cost for the same area. Uh, but, you know, as, as it was pointed out in Germany, I mean, which is a higher latitude, there's a huge growth of solar and there's a huge amount of solar being uh, extracted just because there's so much of it. And as you increase the number of devices, uh, there's an economies of scale. The price of the solar comes down, and that's what we've seen. The price of solar has dropped. Uh, right now, a utility scale solar is on the order of 11 cents a kilowatt hour, uh, even when you amortize over tw 20 years. But, you know, you really should be amortizing over 30 years because that's what a lot of the warranties are for. Okay, so let's then look at uh, what about areas? So how much area does it take to actually provide this power. So let's first do one example, then I'll come to New York State. Let's just look at powering the U.S. on-road vehicles. 100%. If we did everything with battery electrics powered by, or, or uh, ethanol vehicles, how much land would it take? So let's start with cellulosic ethanol. To power the 100% of the U.S. vehicle fleet, it would take between 5 and 35% of the U.S., including Alaska to grow the cellulosic material, the switchgrass. Now, the 5% is the ethanol industry estimate, and the 35% is from scientific studies. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I had to be fair, and this only represents the middle of those two numbers. So if it's actually the scientific estimate, then it would be a much larger circle than this. <laughs> so anyway, you can see that this is really, you're never going to do this at any large scale. It just, it's never going to happen at a large scale. Uh, corn ethanol, there's less uncertainty because it actually exists, but um, it's still between 10 and 18 percent. So this, this circle represents 14 percent of the United States, including Alaska. Now, nuclear, one of its problems is not area. It doesn't take up a lot of area. Uh, it's about the size of Rhode Island to power the U.S. vehicle fleet if you want to put the plants plus the surrounding buffer areas. So we can sacrifice Rhode Island, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I'm not saying it has all the other problems I referred to. I'm just the area, though, is not the is not the bigger issue. Well, this includes the waste area. You do need area for the waste too, so that's part of this area. So it's, but the cost of the waste and the and the, the time it you, re, you need to store it for three hundred thousand three, yeah, three hundred thousand years. Basically, that's why Yucca Mountain it's, it only would store it for ten thousand years, but you need it to be stored for three hundred thousand years. And that's the why they shut Yucca Mountain now. Now, wind, it's actually the black is the spacing between the turbines, and the red dot in the middle is the actual area to power the whole U.S. vehicle fleet. The footprint to power the whole U.S. vehicle fleet of wind turbines, which you need 73,000 to 143,000 5 megawatt wind turbines to, to provide electricity for electric vehicles, you need, it's one to three square kilometers of land. That's it land on the ground, one to three square kilometers to power the whole U.S. vehicle fleet. Now the black, which is the space between the turbines, that would be about half a percent of the U.S., so one-thirtieth the area of corn ethanol. 
So why would you use corn ethanol when you can do something with one thirtieth the spacing area, which can be used for many purposes, including agriculture, open space, or rangeland, or farmland, or open ocean. See, you could power the whole vehicle fleet with that area off the east coast. And you're just, you're just, the footprint on the ground is only one to three square kilometers. Plus there's, some, there's, you know, there's some a little additional uh, small areas associated with it, but it's on the order of a few more square kilometers. But uh, solar and geothermal, solar is one third the spacing area of wind, but much higher footprint if it's on the ground. If it's all on rooftops, then it's, we don't count that as footprint because it's existing uh, structures. So solar doesn't take up much land area. And geothermal is even less uh, f a spacing area than wind or, than or solar, but still a larger footprint than wind. But so wind, geothermal, and solar are actually not taking up much room. So what about New York State? So this is the area needed to power the entire state for all purposes, for everything. And so you get rid of, again, this is not counting what you're displacing. This is just the, I mean, you, so if you want to actually subtract off the land that's taken up by the current energy infrastructure, you know, you can chip away at all these things. But the wind, which is the blue, the red dot in the middle is the actual footprint on the ground, and the blue is just space in between that you can use for multiple purposes. So you can put this on farmland, on land, and rangeland, or, you know, it could be some other open space. So it's not actually land being used for, divide, for uh, structures. The red is solar and PV power plants or CSP. Um, but at the, uh, the bottom red one is rooftop solar. So that would go on roofs. And then offshore wind is the big blue. And the green dot, there's a small green dot you can barely see. So it would require uh, on the order of less than 2% you know, of the state's land. And most, a lot of that is open space. Okay, what about reliability? So people say the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. That's true. But it turns out by combining wind and solar, which are complementary in nature, when the wind is not blowing, the sun is often shining, and vice versa, during the day, that is. And if you use those two, and also hydroelectric to fill in the gaps, or concentrated solar to fill in the gaps at night, and some geothermal as base load, this is what you get. So we did a study for California looking at every hour of every day for 2005 and six to see if we took the demand, and this is for two particular days, if we took the demand, which is the black line, and then the red on the bottom is geothermal, which is base load, so the light blue is wind, and we took actual wind data from five different locations in the state, and solar or PV is the yellow, concentrated solar is the orange, so there's a little bit at night in some cases, like here. And then the blue is hydroelectric. So we did not increase the hydroelectric. This is the existing hydroelectric in California. We only increased wind and solar and increased geothermal just a small amount. And we can match the power demand on these two days exactly without any natural gas use. And the gray is the backup, which was natural gas in this case. So we didn't use any of it. Same thing on this other day. It turned out that we can do this on 99.8% of all hours over two years using real data for the wind and the solar in California. We didn't only needed natural gas 0.2% of all the hours. But this was without even doing other things that could get rid of the rest of the natural gas, such as uh, demand response, where utilities will give incentives uh, for customers to not use electricity at a certain time of day instead of use it like a wastewater treatment plant. They could use the electric, you know, pay for them to use the electricity at night instead of during the day because it doesn't really matter when they use it. Uh, forecasting the weather better so you have lower backup reserve requirements. Uh, oversizing the grid because we not only want to power the electric power sector, but also transportation and everything else, heating and cooling. So if we oversize, we put, have more wind and solar than we need for electricity. And then when we have too much of it, we dump the rest of it uh, into hydrogen production, which we'll need for other sectors. We dump some of the rest of it into district heating like they do in Denmark where when they have extra wind, it goes into heating the cities. And also, uh, for example, we could have extra solar. We can use it for the seasonal heating, like the example I showed you. There are a lot of ways uh, to do this, to really to optimize the system. It's just an optimization problem. It's not rocket science. 
So the point is you can do it, and when the next time a utility tells you, oh, this is too difficult, the wind is too intermittent, it would cost a lot, that's nonsense. They just haven't tried this. They've never done this. They've never done this experiment. They've never done this academically. They haven't even come close to this. They're just lying through their teeth. It's, a, it's because they do not know, they do, they, they've never tried this. And they, so they cannot say that it won't work because they have no clue if it works or not. This would be, in this case, since we have five wind farms, we just need the transmission from those five wind farms. And the solar, I forget how many solar places, but probably around the same five to 10 solar locations. So, I mean, if we do this large scale renewable energy system, then we're going to need more transmission. That's probably one of the biggest uh, limiting factors is the, not because it's a technical or even a cost thing. It's more, again, nimbyism to try to uh, increase transmission. Nobody wants to add the transmission and nobody wants to pay for it either. It's not that it costs a lot more, but nobody wants to pay for it. Anyway, um, I was promised that we'd ask all the questions at the end, so I'll get <laughs> back to that. Uh, so in Europe, they have a similar idea of trying to interconnect through transmission. Uh, wind and solar from the uh, Sahara Desert in the south with wind and uh, hydroelectric in the north and some hydroelectric in Switzerland and other places. Uh, Spain has a lot of wind and solar and in southern Europe there's a lot of solar. So this is referred to as desert tech. It's an idea of interconnecting over a large region uh, these renewable energy systems to really make this system more efficient. So in fact, because if you really want a really efficient system, you want to draw your resources from a lot of different locations so that if the wind is not blowing and the sun isn't shining in some place, then it will likely be doing that in somewhere else. So we've also been looking at islands. So for example, American Samoa, there's those twin islands of Ofu and Asuegu, and they pay 51 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity, which is diesel, and we put up a anemometer and some uh, solar measurements and also so they have turns out they have a lot of wind they have a lot of solar and they also have hydro coming down from a volcano so you can have some pumped hydro so we're looking to optimize the system of just you know one, a couple wind turbines because there's not that many people there some solar devices and pumped hydro so you can do this on a small scale by combining these renewables it's, again it's just an optimization problem it's not rocket science so what about the costs and we'll look at transmission costs too. So these are the amortized costs, not the capital costs. So they account for the capital cost plus the op uh, operation and maintenance cost plus the interest rate over a period of time. Uh, and so currently onshore wind, it's four to seven cents a kilowatt hour. And we expect in 2020 to 30, uh, it'll be similar or less. Offshore wind is much more expensive right now because it's not done on economies of scale. So 10 to 17. Now keep in mind, just for perspective, the price of electricity in New York State is 18.1 cents a kilowatt hour for residential electricity. The US average is 13 cents a kilowatt hour. And so it's more expensive here. Now this doesn't mean, there are a lot of other factors that go into the electricity price, not just this, but this is the direct cost, not the price of electricity. This is the cost of, of these generators. So wave power, we don't, it's actually probably closer to 20 cents, so it's, there's not very much of it, and it's pretty expensive right now. Geothermal, though, is 4 to 7. Hydroelectric is on the order of 4. Concentrated solar, 10 to 15. Solar PV at utility scale is 9 to 13. This is a pretty firm number now. Tidal is greater than 11. But we expect all these to go down. Conventional fuels are 7 cents a kilowatt hour on average. Some are higher and some are lower. But their externality cost, which is their health, mostly the health costs and also some of their climate costs. And it's a very conservative number. It's at least five cents a kilowatt hour. So that's 12.3. So on a, on a, from an economics point of view, not the business perspective, several of these are clearly less expensive than the conventional fuels. Even from the business expense, uh, perspective, onshore wind, geothermal, and hydro are very competitive with conventional fossil fuels. This is why wind is the second largest new source of electric power in the US for, on average for five years. And in fact, uh, during uh, this year, it's, a, it's again the second largest, but in September, uh, the only new source of electric power in the United States, the only two new sources were wind and solar. There was no natural gas or coal or anything else installed in the United States in September. It might have been a fluke, but that's how it was. And uh, solar is now the fourth largest new source of electric power in the US after coal. Coal is third 
wind is second, and natural gas is barely first. Now, just to see, one of the benefits of wind, water, and sun is the price stability. And this can be demonstrated, uh, sorry, I'll get to that in a sec. This is a, the subsidy. So we're facing the lower cost of uh, fossil fuels is partly due to this, low cost is partly due to the subsidies. Between 2002 and 2008, and you can look at this source to get the, this is the raw, to get the raw source of this information. You can look at the $72.5 billion in the U.S. went to coal, oil, and gas, including, you can see these, this list, this laundry list of subsidies. So I'm not going to read them all. But it's compared to uh, wind and solar were $5 billion during the same period, $5 billion. Not $90 billion, as some have said. But it's five, So there's still, wind and solar subsidies have grown but they still pale, especially when you compare the historically, uh, because these guys have been subsidized for decades. It's not just they just didn't start getting subsidized. So if you look at the first, first 15 years of subsidies of the nuclear industry, the oil and gas, and coal industries, and the renewable industries, you know, the renewable industries get one-sixth the subsidies compared to the coal, oil, and gas uh, for their first 15 years. So it's it's really not even a comparison. You know, if you really want to grow a market, you have to subsidize them to some degree. Okay, just to demonstrate that wind, for example, actually may reduce your cost of electricity. If you take the five states in the U.S. with the highest percentage of electric power from wind, and these are South Dakota, which generated 22.3% of all its electric power from wind last year, Iowa, North Dakota, Minnesota, and Wyoming. Their uh, cost of electricity increased from two, uh, two cents a kilowatt hour from 2003 to 11. The rest of the U.S., 3.6 cents. Uh, Hawaii went up from 16 cents to 33 cents a kilowatt hour. So uh, 17 cents a kilowatt hour increase. So the, the states with the highest electric power had the least increase in price of, wind, of their energy. Sorry, the states with the highest penetration of wind had the least increase in price. This doesn't necessarily prove anything, but it, it does dampen that argument that, oh, these renewables are so expensive, they're going to cause our electricity prices to go up. No, they actually stabilize the price because it's all capital, it's upfront cost in wind, but they have no fuel cost. Whereas all these other fuels, they have fuel costs that go up over time because of the scarcity of the fuel. You have to mine the fuel, so work, wages go up. Uh, you have to transport it and then refine it often. So that's why Hawaii's price of electricity has gone up so much. It's because they don't produce it. They only have 3% wind there, and they're transporting all their fuel there. And that's why American Samoa, it's 50 cents a kilowatt hour, because you have to transport the diesel in to get them to run. So it's just really nonsensical, again, to say that you know, renewables will drive electricity prices up. It's just not true, uh, especially when you account for the social costs and the price stability over time. Okay, so what about, so let's look at the social costs for a second. New York State, as I said, 4,000 people die every year from air pollution prematurely. At about $8 million a life, statistical cost of life, that's $33 billion. That's 3% of the New York State GDP is wasted basically on loss of life and morbidity due to air pollution every, every year. Now, we need, if we wanted to convert the entire energy infrastructure, if we look at that, that um, one slide where I had all the generators for New York State, and you just put a price on each generator, it would be about $570 billion of capital costs. But that would be amortized over time, so you're not going to just spend it all right away. We're thinking in a transition of 20 to 40 years, where we put all new generation starting today, so that by two, that you really have all new generation, and then you fa start phasing out existing fossil and nuclear, et cetera. Uh, so this would be spread out over time. But if you just, without even selling the electricity, this theoretically could be paid for by the health cost savings alone in 17 years. If you start selling the electricity, which you have to do, without any profit, then you could reduce that to like nine-year payback time. Whereas the fossil fuels under the same scenario uh, would take a lot longer. What about job creation? Well, we calculated using the NREL JEDI model, for, which looks at jobs for solar and wind and other renewables, you generate about 71,000 permanent jobs per year. 
And currently, there are about 35,000 energy-related jobs in the state of New York. So you could, you'd have a net generation of around 35,000. And almost since we, uh, New York does not produce much of its own uh, natural gas, coal, or, or oil right now, it's really importing most of its fuel. Uh, almost all the jobs here would be local jobs in the state, as opposed to jobs that are exported to other states or countries. And as I mentioned, the prices of are zero for the fuel, so you would have a price stability. So finally, there are some myths about wind, water, and sun I just want to uh, just address really quickly before I wrap it up. Uh, and so you probably heard all these. Well, first is renewable energy can't possibly be used to provide the world's energy because there's not enough of it. It takes too much space and it's expensive. So we've, we've looked at how much wind and solar there are. There's plenty to power the whole world for all purposes many times over. It doesn't take up so much space. It's on the order on the global scale. We calculated it would take 0.6% uh, new lo world land and 0.4% for spacing. Oh, sorry, it's the other way around. 0.4% of land for footprint, 0.6% for spacing. So 1% of the world to power the entire world for all purposes. That's 1% of the world's land on a worldwide scale. In New York State, it's a little higher. Not just, that's including the spacing area. It's on the order of 2%. Uh, natural gas is a clean fuel, so there's no reason to use it. Well, it's, we've talked about that. It's, natural gas is not a clean fuel. It's an air pollutant. And it's a global warming agent. It produces about 50 times more pollution than wind energy. There's no reason to transition quickly from fossil fuels to wind, water, and sun. Well, if you want to have more disasters in your state and see the global climate uh, deteriorate rapidly and air pollution problems to continue, then you're right. Uh, natural gas reduces global warming relative to coal, so it should be used as a bridge fuel. This is not true. Natural gas increases global warming uh, relative to coal. It, it decreases air pollution. That part is true, but it does not reduce global warming. Uh, electric cars don't go very far, take forever to charge, it costs a lot to drive. Well, so the, as I mentioned, the Tesla Model S now goes 310 miles on a one hour charge, so it's, it's We've uh, gone across that barrier. So, and in terms of the cost, there's still more. The capital cost of an electric car is higher than that of a regular car, but the fuel cost is basically one fifth. So you'll make up that capital cost uh, far more than you'll spend over the life of a car. Uh, just a couple more. Renewable energy, such as wind and solar, are uncontrollable, so it cannot be used to provide electric power reliably. Uh, this is not true. It's an optimization problem. And it really just requires uh, just thinking about the problem and, and optimizing. Wind, water, and solar technologies are much more expensive than fossil fuels. Uh, well, some of them are more expensive still, but others are on par or less expensive in terms of direct cost, and more of them are less expensive in terms of their economic cost. And renewable energy technologies won't create so many jobs as fossil fuels. Uh, that's actually not true either. Some studies have shown that on an energy basis, renewable energies create on the order of between three and nine times more jobs uh, than fossil fuels. And wind turbines kill more birds than do other energy sources. That's not true either. R wind turbines reduce bird kills compared to natural gas and coal by a factor of 10 per kilowatt hour generated. It's because uh, coal and natural gas, they both have mining, they have air pollution, they have buildings that they kill 10 times more birds per kilowatt hour generated than wind turbines. Nuclear, in fact, is about the same as wind per kilowatt hour. Wind turbines and solar panels take up a lot of land. Uh, that's not true. Wind turbines take up virtually no land on the ground and footprint, but they do take up space between that can be used for multiple purposes. Solar panels uh, take up some land, but it's, uh, a lot can be put on rooftops. So oh, here are the bird deaths in case you want to see. Um, in the US, sorry, it's time so bird deaths in the US from the Bird Conservancy and the Wildlife Service, up to 400,000 birds per year. Communication towers, four to 50 million birds. Cats, 80 million. <laughs> Buildings, uh, 0.3 to 1 billion birds every year. Bird death rates from wind are about 0.3 per gigawatt hour for wind, 0.4 for nuclear, and 5.2 for coal and natural gas. And you can see the sources there. OK. To summarize, converting to wind, water, and sun, and electricity, and hydrogen, and reduce power demand in the world, 32%. In New York State, it would be 37%. Eliminate two and a half to three million deaths per year worldwide, uh, pr providing energy stability and eliminating global warming. Uh, you generate more permanent jobs than you destroy, uh, especially for New York State. 
you reduce economic, the economic electricity cost compared with fossil fuel costs, uh, require 4.4% more of the world's land for footprint, 0.6% for space. There are many methods of addressing variability. And materials, although I didn't talk about them, are not limits, although recycling may be needed at some point for some, component, for some materials. There are, the barriers are mostly upfront cost to get the thing rolling. Transmission needs, not because it's a, a cost problem or even a technical problem, it's just very difficult to get transmission changed, except if you're like in a, a centrally controlled uh, government like in China, they can get transmission up immediately. If you look at, if you've been to Three Gorges Dam, there, that's, which is a huge dam, it's just power, so much power goes through there, they put in this one transmission line that's just stacked, lots of transmission lines right on top of each other all the way to Beijing. And you can never do that here because of the regulatory environment, because it's, you know, it's probably dangerous, but <laughs> um, so you need to space them out enough, but you know, you can put up transmission if you have enough willpower to do it and if you do it in a safe way. Finally, um, if you're interested in solving the problem for New York State or around the country, um, we have this group that's called the Solutions Project. And right now there's just a website you can put in your email address if you want to get information once we go public. It's, it's not public yet, but there is a slot where you can put your email address if you're interested in, in participating or just want to get information from it. There's also a Twitter site or Twitter address you can join that. And if you want papers on the scientific um, work that was done here, uh, at least most of it, the New York State stuff is not published yet, but it uh, should be probably in the next couple months. Um, well, there are a lot, there's a lot of information at this website above that contains kind of the scientific underpinnings of most of the stuff that I talked about today. So I think uh, open it up for questions, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was a very uh, informative and educational uh, uh, session. So we hope we have some journalists here in the audience that take a lot of those detailed knowledge back to radio station, TVs, newspapers, and to politicians. I think uh, one of the problems is there hasn't been enough information what new technology is available and what one can do. And we got a very nice lecture on this today. So thank you. Now we can start with some um, questions and maybe there are some downsides of this. So you <laughs> see. Um, yes, uh, microphones are working on the left and the right, but let just me uh, organize this a little bit. So, uh, Ed, you want to go? I'd just like to. Is it on? Is it working? Yeah. I'd just like to raise uh, <clears throat> the subject of fracking a little bit further, because it's intensely uh, political in the state of New York right at the moment, and uh, a number of claims are made. And I'd like to uh, ask you to maybe expound a little bit more on what you have said. Uh, one thing is that it's relatively inexpensive compared to oil. And I'd like to ask about <clears throat> the expense of natural gas coming from fracking. A second thing is that it is going to enable the United States to become energy independent in two ways. One through natural gas, but the same technology applied to oil itself particularly to wells that have been exhausted and to certain kinds of new wells. So that it has been claimed recently that within five years, if it invests in fracking, the U.S. can produce more oil as well as natural gas than Saudi Arabia. Now, uh, there's also another topic which you didn't mention. Can I try to answer those first? Okay. <laughs> You want to answer this or another? Right, yeah, why don't I try to answer one at a time? Okay, yeah. Well, so from my point of view, I mean, if we're just interested in the energy part, you know, we could satisfy, we have 100 years of coal, so we could become energy independent with coal, 
and, and burn a lot of it, and we can burn natural gas, we can dig for more oil. So there's no doubt that we could become energy independent with our current energy sources if, we, if you really put your mind to it and put enough money into it. I can't answer what the cost of fracking is because I just don't, I'm not an expert in the cost of fracking. Maybe somebody else here knows. Um, I can say that I would say we can do, we can definitely become energy independent with clean renewable energy, with wind, water, and sunlight. And that's forever because the, whatever, there's, even if we did coal, it would disappear too. It's a, there's like 100 years of life left. Uh, natural oil, peak oil, it's, it's all moving target, maybe 35 years or something. You know, natural gas, who knows? There might be a boon now, but it might we find that there's not so much, maybe another 35, 50 years or something. So it'll eventually disappear, but these other ones will not disappear. So it, the faster we transition to these other ones, these clean energies, uh, the better from in the long term, the, from a price stability point of view and the social stability point of view, and definitely from air pollution and climate, because we don't, it, you know, if we go more natural gas, I mean, we're, we're going to burn off the Arctic ice. It's, I mean, you know, catastrophe is, is just looming here. So I think that I think we really need to move away from that concept that we can, reliance is not the issue. It's, it's, it's national security and international security and safety and health of our populations. Uh, but price, you know, I just can't say what the price of fracking is. Okay, going to go to the next. Um, Dr. Jacobson, you hear the politicians talk a lot about clean coal. Uh, am I correct? My understanding is that it's actually it's a myth at the moment that there's not a single plant in the country that is actually using the uh, carbon sequestration uh, process. Is that correct? Um, yes, and that's the coal I was talking about, clean coal I was talking about in the talk, which is all you're doing is reducing CO2 from the exhaust by about 85 to 90 percent. But because you're not reducing any of the mining or transport of the coal, your CO2 from that stays the same, and that's about a third of the total and plus the f uh, five to 10% or five, 10 to 15%. So you still have uh, more than a third of the CO2 from original coal, but you have 25% more air pollution from and more 25% more coal use. And so there, and there is no, there is no commercial scale uh, sequestration, coal plant with sequestration, you're right. There are some uh, other types of plants that do testing, but th there's nothing at the commercial scale. Yep. I also quickly want to announce there's a reception after the talk, so uh, there's something uh, still more coming, so you don't have to run away. <laughs> okay, so next speaker. Yeah, thank you. You've done an amazing um, service to all of us to learn this. And I just wondered, they, somebody announced that you're working with Secretary Chu or you have uh, on a panel with him or something, and I just wondered what reaction you're getting from the Department of Energy and also from Governor Cuomo, if you have access to those people, whether you've met with them or can you meet with them potentially? Well, so I, so I was on a, an advisory panel uh, for the Secretary of Energy um, in the Renewables Division, and that panel wrapped up. But it, it really didn't focus. I mean, the, Secret, the Department of Energy, they're really a funding agency for research projects. So they don't really set energy policy except to the extent that they decide what research they want to fund. So there is a limited things that you can do in that panel. But you know, they're, what they're doing in the, in the renewables division of the Department of Energy is really good stuff. I mean, they have this goal, for example, for a dollar a watt solar. I mean, right now, the utilities, that's everything, including the panels plus the um, balance of cost. And right now, the utility scale solar is about 250 or so. So they're actually, it's come down from like five, six, seven, eight dollars before. So they're, they've come a long way, but they really have a good goal to get to a dollar a watt, and they also have good wind programs, so they're doing a lot of good stuff. They, I mean, they also do stuff I don't really like, but I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> but um, with regards to New York State, yeah, with the Solutions Project, we have a goal to really try to affect the, bring the information to policymakers and the public uh, about energy in the state, and hope, hope that the policymakers will make good decisions. And so, you know, we don't have a uh, anything specific I can talk about, but um, we do have a goal within the next few months to really make a big push to bring this information public. In the next few months, you said? Two, well, one to two months. Thank you. Okay, so please, next person. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation. And when you mentioned of, uh, about the Japanese children and 43% uh, of the children having enlarged cysts, what, what radius? thyroid, th you know, enlarged thyroid. 
What what was the radius around the plant that we're taking? Oh, this is uh, so. These are children in the Fukushima prefecture. So, all children in the Fukushima prefecture. So you can probably look at a map. I don't know the numbers in terms of the the radius, but you could probably look at a map. So the, in the city of Fukushima, plus the whole prefecture around it. And so, yeah, they were they are thyroid cysts that. Yeah, because we have a nuclear power plant about what thirty miles from here. At yeah. Indian Point, and it's 40 years old. Oh yeah, well it's going to be less than 30 miles for, mm. for the most part. But and another thing, we're, we've clearly entered the age of climate turmoil. You know, not just with Sandy, but with the Pakistani floods, the you know, fires in our west, the fires in the the in, in Russia. Um, at what point is it going to stop? And at what point? <laughs> And, you know, or will, will it ever stop, and at what point will it be stabilized? Because my fear is that, you know, we'll, we'll do everything we need to do, and that we'll be held back politically because people won't see a difference. Well, so CO2, which has the longest-lived gas, if you stopped its emissions today, its impacts will still be seen for the next 150 to 200 years. And, but if you kept the emissions constant, uh, it will still grow for 50 years. The concentration in the atmosphere will still increase if you just kept the emissions constant for another 50 years. And so that's keeping it constant. But we're not even keeping it constant. We're actually increasing the trajectory. So it's really damaging. Now, CO2 is only about, four, as I said, about 42% of global warming. So you have these short-lived gases and particles that you can control and have to try to balance out the CO2 rising effect. But if under this plan, we're eliminating all CO2 from anthropogenic sources, all black carbon, all methane, all everything that causes warming. And so you'll still see things get worse for a little while, but then eventually within the next you know, 50 to 100 years, then you, things will start to get better if we stopped it today. But we're not even close to stopping it today. That's the yep, problem. Hey, thanks for speaking today. Sure. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm a permaculture contractor. I work in Detroit and Michigan and Denver. So mostly my concerns with, you know, selling and retrofitting products for people. In Michigan, we, we have low light. My question is about low light solar. Oh, we, so we have to have a catchment system. Okay. And it works still well. It can power, you know, a pretty big, nice house. Okay. And I've been hearing a lot of talk about, like, low light solar panels <coughs> made out of silica sand. But I haven't seen anyone selling them or producing them. Have you encountered anything like that in your, in your journey? Um, not specifically. Not so much. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I, yeah. Because there are a lot of startups and there are a lot of companies that are producing all sorts of neat things. Uh -huh. So I can't keep track of everything. But, oh, yeah, uh, sure. Because <laughs> it's low cost, you know, and you get a better harvest of power. Yeah, that's great. If, if, uh -huh. um, well, I totally encourage what you're doing. So okay, okay. thank you. Out. Thanks. Okay, next. Uh, this has been wonderful. really has. Um, I have two quick questions. The 71,000 jobs that you're talking about in New York State, uh, would these be good paying jobs or would they be low level jobs? That's one question. The other is how well would uh, wind turbines uh, withstand uh, a storm like Sandy if we had had wind turbines offshore in Rockaway? Uh, good questions. Well, so those are permanent jobs. As opposed to, in addition, there are 3.6 million temporary jobs that would probably be some lower paying, some higher paying, for, that were short term. Um, I can't say what the wages, well, we did, no, we did calculate the revenue stream. So I don't remember what the average job wage was because it does vary by state in this model. And so it, we did have that number. I just don't remember what the number. So, th but they are, I would say they're probably just as good as the jobs that were here, is my guess. I, I, with, I can't really say without looking exactly what the numbers were. But they were permanent jobs that uh, generated revenue that I think is pretty standard for the energy industry. And with regard to the uh, wind turbines, th they can withstand uh, between, with that, well, there's a, there's a shutoff wind speed at 30 meters a second. Then there's a destruction wind speed about between 50 and 60 meters per second, which is like a category, up to a category three hurricane. So they can, and this hurricane was only a category one or two or something. It wasn't as hurricanes go, this wasn't a strong hurricane, but its damage was significant because of the, the higher sea level and the fact that you're not really used to it here. And, but it, you can imagine, if you had a wall of turbines, they extract energy, so they slow down the wind. So they actually take energy out of the hurricane. 
So that's a positive benefit of having wind turbines is <laughs> you would reduce the wind speeds. It's like, it's like a, instead of building a seawall, how about building, <laughs> which is what the governor was proposing to build a seawall with the 30 billion he's asking Obama for. So instead of doing that, if you put a bunch of turbines up, they would be an automatic seawall to reduce the wind speed. <laughs> Hi, I'm also a student here at the new school, and I'm also working on uh, renewable energy. Use the mic. Okay, I'm using the mic. Uh, I'm, stu I'm studying in e economics here, and I'm uh, also focusing on renewable energy. And uh, there are three things where I would like to, where I would be interested in your statement or uh, additional information on. Um, one is you were mentioning con concentrating solar power, and well, one issue involved with that is that it's um, only able to utilize solar radiation, which is direct, which means that if you have clouds or fog or anything like this, you can't produce output. So in a state like New York, I think that would be more of a problem than, for example, in Arizona. Like, for example, in Germany, that would not be uh, discussed as an alternative because of like a lot of clouds you experience during daytime. Um, the second thing, uh, the water depth you mentioned in New York, I, I don't know about uh, the, the U.S. that much about the, the water depth on the coastlines, but it's a kind of important factor, and I would like to like, know more about that also maybe in the Great Lakes. There's a, a lot of wind speed going on there. Mm. Um, because if you double like, the water depth from like, 20 to 40 meters in Europe, you, double or, uh, you, you roughly double the initial investment costs, and they're already very high for offshore wind. The third thing... Um, now, yeah, when it comes to grid st stability and uh, in the electric uh, power industry, uh, German data on wind and solar output shows for the last four years that the combined capacity utilizations of wind and solar output, they fall to 0% in frequent uh, instances. So if you don't have like a renewable backup capacity, you need either conventional backup capacities or you need storage in a large amount. So that is, of course, like increasing a lot of costs. So let me address these in reverse order. Um, so for our California study, we had hours of zero wind, zero solar, and it worked. Okay. You, don't, you, you don't need backup because we had sufficient hydro that would back it up. There were, as I said, there were 0.2% of the hours where we did need backup, so those are probably... The worst, some of the worst cases, but the, actually, it's again, you, you can do it without, in, in Germany, you can also do it because you have so much, if you actually tapped into the Norway hydro yeah, a little more, true. you can do it, and that's what Denmark is trying to do. The Dutch are also interested in that hydropower. <laughs> yeah, so you don't want to just use wind and solar alone. Yeah. That's why you need uh, good storage. But there's not only that, there's also in, there's the oversizing and the district heating that makes it easier to... Uh, because even there's never, and if you interconnect geographically dispersed wind and solar uh, enough, then you don't have this problem. So if you have the desert tech system, you never run into that problem because you just get your wind and solar from even the Sahara Desert in some cases. Regarding the depth, so we did a bathymetry map, well, we did mapping the offshore East Coast wind resources. At this site, you can link to another site where we have papers where we've done in detail the winds as a function of depth in the Atlantic offshore the east coast we quantified in each depth region what's the total wind resource and we've done it we've looked at a transmission cable you know where we put one to optimize the system so we all those numbers are all the calculations we quantified how much is available in each depth resource yeah it does become more expensive as you go further out um, but of course hopefully we'll get to the floating turbines when it won't actually matter so much with regard to csp um, well, so if you look at the solar map, even from the NREL map, there are places that, I should, that actually have pretty good solar for even CSP. It's not, certainly, it's going to be more expensive. But if you look at the southern part of New York, it's the same latitude where they have the Avangoa Spain solar plant. And so it's, I mean, maybe there's less clouds in Spain at that place. But, you know, you get enough days where you do have solar. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means it's less efficient. So I... I'm not saying you necessarily would. Maybe it's all going to be PV. Maybe you won't, uh, you won't use it so much. But uh, just because it's more expensive doesn't mean you wouldn't do it if it's still less expensive than some of the alternatives when you count for everything. Okay. Thank you. Just have the next three questions and then, then uh, stop there. Yeah. We still have the three Thank questions you. coming. Thank you for your excellent work.
Um, you've looked at 2030 as uh, a goal. Have you figured into this the permitting process, the land use permitting process? Not really, in the sense that, well, because we're looking at a roadmap rather than a specific implementation okay. at this point. But that would be another step if, to do this. In and and the, um, I'm just curious, uh, there, is there a different type of grid that is needed to be hooked into when you're using these different energy sources? Do we need a different infrastructure than we have now? Well, if you're doing long distance transmission, which you wouldn't necessarily do a lot of in New York State, except maybe north to south, then you'd use high voltage direct current lines because it's more of the less line losses. So for long distances, that's really especially important if you're tapping into wind and solar in the Great Plains or the Southwest, then you'd, you want to go across 2,000 kilometers, you'd use high voltage direct current. And this would be a new infrastructure that we'd, we would be building to accommodate this, or does no, it exist you already? No, you can use the same line pathways, you just need a different line. Different, it's, Thank you. Thank you so much. It's rare to hear a talk on climate change that has hope. So, Thanks. <laughs> um, I was wondering, you know, people talk about the energy that it takes to um, produce photovoltaic solar panels. So yeah. I wondered if you could address that a little bit. Yeah, that's why they're ranked five and not one. <laughs> because they, they have embodied energy. So wind turbine, uh, it takes about three months, three to five months of running it to pay back the energy it takes to, to produce the turbine, but it runs for 30 years. So it's basically 99% carbon free. So it's that three to five months that you're paying for. For the solar, it's on the order of one to two years. So it's, it's less efficient, the solar PV that is. CSP, that's why CSP is higher because it actually has less embodied energy to produce the CSP because mostly it's just steel and concrete and some mirrors. And so, but it's, it's still much, uh, it's still really clean, especially with higher solar you know, especially when you get to southwest solar, then it's, you know, it's on the order of a year payback time in terms of the energy. Thank you. I have a half a million questions, so I don't know how many of them I can get through. Um, I, I, I think the Desert Tech process is, is mostly a state, statified. It's somewhat private, but more state than private in Europe. I, I don't think the American grid is anywhere near a statified process. It's all private. And I think Obama actually made the decision, as he did with health care, to keep it private early in the, in the first uh, administration. I, I, it's my understanding that New York State actually does want to import wind from North Dakota and is building something. But it's, 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 is it, I, I mean, I, you would know more about that than I haven't heard about it for several years. I heard that that was going to happen. I have other questions. Is our solar panels, do they have a, 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 an albedo that absorbs heat or radiates heat? Because one of the questions about the, the Arctic melting is that it's a positive feedback. Is it possible to do someplace else a positive feedback? For example, Mayor Bloomberg actually has a project, only a demonstration project, of white roofs for, for certain parts of the city and showed there was less local warming from that, but it was creating an albedo that was just local. Yeah, so well, let me address the white roofs. Okay. So yeah, we've looked at white roofs. We did a, a mo global modeling mm -hmm. study of white roofs, and we found that you can cool the air locally due to white roofs because you're reflecting more sunlight and you get mm -hmm. less energy in your, into your house. But because you stabilize the air, you actually increase the air pollution okay. locally. And also you reduce the cloudiness above, which is re reflective. So on the large scale, and the clouds, so on the large scale, you actually increase your warming because of the reduction of the cloudiness. And it's worse as you go to higher latitudes, which is like New York. So if you're in the South Desert, then you're going to get the best cooling because you, you know, reduce your air conditioning use the most, and you can get some benefit, local benefit, but it's causing warming. But instead of that, why not put solar panels on your roof? Because you not only generate electricity, so reducing your fossil fuel use for heating or cooling, but you also cool your house by about 20%. So you reduce your, because you extract 20% of the energy for electric power generation. Therefore, you make your house cooler too. So it's silly to me to paint anything white. Because first of all, it's, the soot goes on it and it becomes brown, black <laughs> within a few months. Unless you're sitting there scrubbing it every few months, it's, it's really ineffective. But you're doing, putting solar, you get two benefits for the, 
without even um, having to worry about those other, that other problem. Could New York City have a lot of solar panels on its roofs and oh, yeah. effectively reduce? Definitely. I mean, I've heard that it could, it could uh, replace the power, yeah. the uh, Indian Point plant with roofs. Roof yeah, plant. I mean, there's plenty of rooftops in New York City and <laughs> Long Island, and, and you know, there's effective solar. The solar resources are pretty good overall, even though you know, it looks cloudy a lot, but it's actually, there's a lot of diffuse radiation plus direct. Could I ask one more question? How far away do human houses have to be from wind for them not to be bothersome for the residents? I've heard that, that it has caused problems for some. Well, I mean, nobody puts a wind turbine right next to a house. I can say, I can't say that there was a study by Lawrence Berkeley Lab that looked at the property values near wind farms in the U.S. And they found that there was no decrease of property values when houses or communities were located in the vicinity of wind farms. I mean, there's not, they're never right next to it. I mean, but they might be in visual sight. And so this is unlike natural gas plants or natural gas mining where your property values go down when your neighbor puts a you know mine on your property because it's just a blight and you have all these traffic and there, there was no price okay. differential statistical okay. noticeable price differential in all the wind farms in the US uh, compared you know compared to places that didn't have wind farms near them thank you so let me just make a few remarks so this was an excellent start, I think, of our two years lecture series. Uh, the next one will be in April on more the European side. Uh, Commissioner Metzger Runge is coming, 3rd of April. And uh, I hope a lot of the information generated here tonight goes out to the public, politician, to the news media. Uh, there was so much detailed information that probably the public doesn't know what can be done and how cheap it is in the long run to have renewable energy and what uh, healthcare problems we avoid in the long run. And so uh, I want to thank uh, Mark for this wonderful lecture tonight. Um, uh, I want to make just one, two quick other announcements. One is there will be a reception so you can now enjoy another hour here and talking to other colleagues or friends or doing networking. Uh, one other uh, information, um, there is in the back is uh, Kamara, this is a PhD student of uh, uh, the new school here. He is from Sierra Leone and he builds um, uh, solar power, want to build solar power for a school in Africa in Solo Sierra Leone. And they need uh, solar power for running computers and for the library. And they don't have any power, neither dirty power nor clean power. So uh, if anybody has some ideas to help them, he has printed a nice card here. You can take it to friends who can uh, help this school to build solar power. Uh, we would be very grateful. We have put something also on the website. And Kamara is there with a the card. So I hope to see you all back on uh, April uh, 3rd and with the uh, continuation of this uh, lecture series. Thank you for coming. <laughs>